So, hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Bella, Chloe, and Pandora. As always, I want to remind you to please stay safe, healthy. Hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. Today we are getting back into Stephen King's uh, Salem's Lot. We are on... Uh, we are on chapter four. Uh, I believe it's part three of chapter four, I believe so. And without further ado, let's get there. Okay, we are on chapter four, subcategory nine, uh, Salem's Lot. Ben was writing when the tap came at the door, and he marked his place before getting up to open it. It was just after three o'clock on Wednesday, September 24th. The rain had ended any plans to search further for Ralphie Glick, and the consensus was, was, was that the search was over. The Glick boy was gone, solid gone. He opened the door, and Parkins Gillespie was standing there smoking a cigarette. He was holding a paperback book and paperback in one hand, and Ben saw with some amusement that it was the bantam edition of Conway's daughter. Come on in, Constable, he said. Wet out there. It is a trifle, Parkin said, stepping in. September's grip weather. I always wear em, wear my galoshes. There's some that laughs, but I ain't had the grip since St. Low France in 1944. Lay your coat on the bed. Sorry I can't offer you coffee. Wouldn't think of wetting it. Parkins said and tapped Ash in Ben's wastebasket, and I just had a cup of Pauline's down to the excellent. Can I do something for you? Well, my wife read this. He held up the book. She heard you you was in town, but she's shy. She kind of thought maybe you might write your name on it or something. Ben took the book. The way Weasel Craig tells it, your wife's been dead 14 or 15 years. That's so, Parkins looked totally surprised. That Weasel, he does love to talk. He'll, he'll open his mouth to... Too wide one day and fall right in it. In. Ben said nothing. Do you suppose you could sign it for me then? Delighted to. We took a pen from the desk. Opened. Excuse me. Opened the book to the flyleaf of Raw Slice, Slice of Life, Cleveland Plain Dealer, and wrote Best wishes to Constable Gillespie from Ben Mears, 92475. He handed it back. I appreciate that, Parkin said, without looking at what Ben had written. He bent over and crushed out of smoke on the side of the wastebasket. That's the only signed book I got. Did you come here to brace me? Ben asked, smiling. You're pretty sharp, Parkin said. I figured I ought to come and ask a question or two, now that you mention it. Waited until Nolly was off somewheres. He's a good boy, but he likes to talk, too. Lordy, the gossip that goes on. What would you like to know? Mostly where you were on that on last Wednesday evening. The, the night Ralph Glick disappeared. Yeah. Am I a suspect, Constable? No, sir. I ain't got no suspects. A thing like this is a, it's outside my tour, you might say. Catching speeders out by Dells or chasing kids out of the park before they turn randy is more my line. I'm just nosing here and there. Suppose I don't want to tell you, Parkins shrugged and produced his cigarettes. That's your business, son. I had dinner with Susan Norton and her folks. Played some badminton with her dad. Bet he beat you, too. He's always He always beats Nolly. Nolly raves up and down about how bad he liked to beat Bill Norton just once. What time did you leave? Ben laughed, but he, the sound did not contain a great deal of humor. You cut right to the bone, don't you? You know, Parkin said, if I was one of those New York detectives, like on TV, I might think you had something to hide the way you poke around my questions. Nothing to hide, Ben said. I'm just d tired of being the stranger in town, getting pointed at in the streets, being nudged over in the library. Now you come around with this Yankee trader routine, trying to find out if I've got Ralphie Glick's scalp in my closet. Now, I don't think that, not at all, he gazed at Ben over his cigarette, and his eyes had gone flinty. I'm just trying to close you off. If I thought you had anything to do with anything, you'd be down in the tank. Okay, Ben said. I left the Norton's around quarter past seven. I had took a walk around out towards Schoolyard Hill when it got dark to see too dark to see. I came back here, wrote for two hours, and went to bed. What time did you get back here? Quarter past eight, I think, around there. Well, that don't clear you as well as I'd like. Did you see anybody? No, Ben said. Not, no one. 
Parkins made a noncommittal grunt and walked toward the typewriter. What are you writing? Well, none of your damn business, Ben said, and his voice had gone tight. I, I'll thank you to keep your eyes and your hands off that, unless you got a search warrant, of course. Kind of touchy, ain't you, for a man who means his books to be read, when it it's gone through three drafts, editorial correction, gal galley-proof corrections, final set in print. I'll personally see that you get four copies signed right now. That comes under the heading of private papers. Parkin smiled and moved away. Good enough. I doubt like hell that it's a signed confession to anything anyway, Ben smiled back. Mark Twain said a novel was a confession to everything by a man who had never done anything. Parkins blew out smoke and went to the door. I won't drip on your rug anymore, Mr. Mears. Want to thank you for your time and just for the record. I don't think you ever saw that glip, boy, but it's my just my it's my job to kind of ask around the uh, ask about these things. Ben nodded. I understood. And you ought to know how things are in places like Salem's Lot or Millbridge or Guilford's any or any little pissant bird. You're the stranger in town until you've been here twenty years. I know, I'm sorry if I snapped at you, but after a week of looking for him and not finding a goddamn thing, Ben shook his head. Yeah, Parkin said. It's bad for his mother. Awful bad. You take care, sure, Ben said. No hard feelings? No, he paused. Will you tell me one thing? I will if I can. Where did you get that book? Really? Parkin's glusby smiled. Well, that's... There's a feller over on, in Cumberland that's got a used furniture barn. Kind of a sissy fella, he is. Name of Gendron. He sells paperbacks a dime apiece. Had five of those. Ben threw back his head and laughed, and Parkins Gillespie went out, smiling and smoking. Ben went to the window and watched until he saw the constable come out and cross the street, walking carefully around puddles in his black galoshes. And we're on to subcategory 10, chapter 4. Parkins paused a moment to look in the show window of the new shop before knocking on the door. When the place he had been, the village, he had been the village washtub, a body could look in here and see nothing. But a lot of fat women in rollers adding bleach or getting change out of the machine in the wall, most of them chewing gum like cows with mouthfuls of mulch. But an interior decorator's truck from Portland had been here yesterday afternoon and most of today and the place looked considerably different. A platform had been shoved up behind the window, and it was covered with a swatch of deep, nubby carpet, light green in color. Two spotlights had been installed up out of sight, and they cast soft, highlighted glows on the three objects that had been arranged in the window, a, a clock, a spinning wheel, and an old-fashioned cherry wood cabinet. There was a small easel in front of each piece and a discreet price tag on each easel. And my God, would anybody in their right mind actually pay $600 for a spinning wheel when they could go down to the value house and get a singer for $48.95? Sign, sighing, Parkins went to the door and knocked. It was opened only a second later, almost as if the new fella had been lurking behind it, waiting for him to come to the door. Inspector, Straker said with a narrow smile, how good of you to drop by. Plain old constable, I guess, Parkins said. He lit a Paul Mall and strolled in. Parkins Gillespie, pleased to meet you. He stuck out his hand. It was gripped, squeezed tight gently by a hand that felt enormously strong and very dry and then dropped. Richard, Richard Throckett Straker, the bald man said. I figured you was, Parkins said. Looking around, the entire shop had been carpeted and was in the process of being painted. The smell of fresh paint was a good one, but there seemed to be another smell underneath it, an unpleasant one. Parkins could not place it. He turned his attention back to Straker. What can I do for you on this so fine day? Straker asked. Parkins turned his mild gaze out the window where the rain continued to pour down. Oh, nothing at all, I guess. I just came by to see, to say, how do? More or less welcome you to the town and wish you good luck, I guess. How thoughtful. Would you care for a coffee, some sherry? I have both out back. No, thanks. I can't stop Mr. Barlow around. Mr. Barlow is in New York on a buying trip. I don't expect him back until at least the 10th of October. You'll be opening without him, then, Parkin said, thinking that if the prices he had seen in the window were any indication, Straker wouldn't exactly be swamped with customers. What's Mr. Barlow's first name, by the way? Straker's smile reappeared razor thin. 
Are you asking in your official capacity, uh, Constable? Nope, just curious. My par partner's full name is Kurt Barlow, Straker said. We work together in both London and Hamburg. This, he swept his arm around him. This is our retirement, modest yet tasteful. We expect to make no more than a living, yet we both love old things, fine things, and we hope to make a reputation in the area, perhaps even throughout it. You're so beautiful New England region. Do you think that would be possible, Constable Gillespie? Anything's possible, I guess, Parkin said, looking around for an ashtray. He saw none. Tapped his cigarette ash into his coat pocket. Anyway, I hope you'll have the best of luck, and tell Mr. Barlow when you see him that, he, that I'm going to try and get around. I'll do so, Straker said. He enjoys company. That's fine, Gillespie said. He went to the door, paused, looked back. Straker was looking at him intently. By the way, how do you like that old house? It needs a great deal of work, Straker said, but we have time. I guess you do, Parkins agreed. Don't suppose you see any Yowens up around there? Straker's brow creased. Yowens? Kids, Parkins explained patiently. You know how that, they sometimes like to devil new folks, throw rocks or ring the bell and run away, that sort of thing? No, Straker said. No children. We seem to kind of have misplaced one. Is that so? Yes, Parkinson said judiciously. Yes, it is. The thinking now is that we may not find him, not alive. What a shame, Straker said distantly. It's, it is kind of if you should see anything. I would, of course, report it to your office post-haste. He smiled his chilly smile again. That's good, Parkinson said. He opened the door and looked <coughs> resignedly out at the par at the pouring rain. You tell Mr. Barlow that I'm looking forward. I certainly will, Constable Gillespie. Chow. Parkins looked back startled. Chow? Starker's sm excuse me, Straker's smile widened. Goodbye, Constable Gillespie. This is the that is a familiar Italian expression for goodbye. Oh, well, you learn something new every day, don't you? Bye. He stepped out into the rain and closed the door behind him. Not familiar to me, it ain't. His cigarette was soaked. He threw it away. Inside, Straker watched him go up the street through the shop, through the show window. He was no longer smiling. And we're on to subcategory 11. When Parkins got back to his office in the municipal building, he called Nolly. You hear, Nolly? No answer. Parkins nodded. Nolly was a good boy, but a little bit short on brains. He took off his coat, unbuckled his galoshes, sat down at his desk, looked up at a telephone looked up a telephone number in the Portland book, and dialed. The other end picked up on the first ring. FBI Portland Agent Hanrahan, this is Parkins Gillespie, constable of Jerusalem's lot township. We got us a missing boy up here. So I understand, Hanrahan said crisply. Ralph Glick, nine years old, four three, black hair, blue eyes. What is it? Kidnap note? Nothing like that. Can you check on some fellows for me? Hanran answered in the affirmative. First one is Benjamin Mears, M-E-A-R-S, writer, wrote a book called Conway's Daughter. The other two are sort of stapled together. Kurt Barlow, B-A-R-L-O-W, the other guy. You spelled that Kurt with a C or K, Hanrahan asked. I don't know. Okay, go on. Parkins did so, sweating. Talking to the real law always made him feel like an asshole. The other guy is Richard Throckett Straker. Two T's on the end of Throckett and Straker like it sounds. This guy and Barlow are in the furniture and antique business. They just opened a little shop here in town. Straker claims Barlow's in New York on a buy-in trip. Straker claims the two of them work together in London and in Hamburg, and I guess that pretty well covers it. Do you suspect these people in the Glick case? Right now, I don't know if they're even as a case, but they all showed up in town about the same time. Do you think there's any connection between this guy Mears and the other two? Parkins leaned back and cocked an eye out the window. That, he said, is one of the things I'd like to find out. And on to subcategory 12, the telephone wires made an odd humming, unclear, cool days, almost as if vibrating with the gossip that is transmitted through them. And it is a sound like no other, the lonely sound of voices flying over space. The telephone pulls a gray and splintery, and the freezes and thaws of winter have heaved them into leaning postures that are casual. They are not business-like and, mili and military-like foam poles anchored in concrete. Their bases are black with tar if they are beside paved roads and flowered with dust if beside the back road. Old weathered 
athlete mark show on their surfaces where linemen have climbed to fix something in 1946 or 1952 or 1969. Birds, crows, sparrows, robins, starlings roost on the humming wires and sit in a hunched silence and perhaps they hear that foreign human sound foreign human sounds through their taloned feet. If so, their beady eyes give no sign. The town has a sense, not of history, but of time. And the telephone poles seem to know this. If you lay your hand against one, you can feel the vibration from the wires deep in the wood, as if souls had been imprisoned in there and were struggling to get out. And he paid with an old twenty. Mabel, one of the big ones, Clyde said he had seen one of those since the run on the Gates Bank and Trust in 1930. He was, yes, he is a peculiar sort of man, Ebby. I've seen him. Th I've seen him through my binocs, trundling around behind the house with a wheelbarrow. Is he up there alone? I wonder. Or Crockett might know, but he won't tell. He's keeping shut about it. He always was a writer at Eva's. I wonder if Floyd Tibbetts n knows he's been spends an awful lot of time at the library. Well, Rudder Starcher says she never saw a fellow who knew so many. She said his name was, yes, it's Straker, Mr. R.T. Straker. Kenny Danless's mom said she stopped by that new place downtown and there was a genuine De Beers cabinet in the window and they wanted $800 for it. Can you imagine? So I, <coughs> excuse me, so I said, funny him coming and that little glick boy. You don't think, no, but it is funny. By the way, do you still have the, that recipe before? The wires hum and hum and hum. And on to subcategory 13. September 23rd, 1975. Name, Glick, Daniel Francis. Address, RFD, number one, Brock Road, Jerusalem's Lot, Maine, 04270. Age, 12, sex male, race, Caucasian. Admitted, September 22nd, 1975. Admitting person, Anthony H. Glick. Father, symptoms, shock, loss of memory, partial, nausea, disinterested in food, constipation, general logginess, tests, see attached sheet. Number one, tuberculosis, skin patch, negative. Number two, tuberculosis, sputum and urine, negative. Number three, diabetes, negative. Number four, white cell count, negative. Number five, red cell count, 45% hemo. Six, marrow sample, negative. 7. Chest X-ray negative. Possible diagnosis. Pernicious anemia, anemia. Primary or secondary. Previous exam shows 86% hemoglobin. Secondary anemia is unlikely. No history of ulcers, hemorrhoids, bleeding, piles, etc. AL. Differential cell count negative. Primary anemia combined with mental shock likely. Recommend barium enema and X-rays for internal bleeding. On the off chance, yet no recent accidents. Father says, also recommend daily dosage of vitamin B, C attached, C, sheet. Pending further tests, let's release him. GM Gorby, attending physician. End of subcategory 13, and we are on to subcategory 14. At 1 o'clock in the morning, September 24th, the nurse stepped into Danny Glick's hospital room to give him his medication. She paused in the doorway, frowning. The bed was empty. His, her eyes jumped from the bed to the oddly wasted white bundle that, that lay collapsed by the foot. Danny, she said. She stepped <coughs> toward him and thought he had to go to the bathroom and it was too much for him, that's all. She turned him over gently and her first thought for realizing that he was dead was that the B-12 had been helping. He looked better than he had since his admission. And then she felt the cold flesh of his wrist and the lack of movement and the light blue tracery of veins beneath her fingers and she ran for the nurse's station to report a death on the ward. So end of chapter four. We are going to start chapter five. Ben, subcategory one. On September 25th, Ben took dinner with the Nortons again. It was Thursday night, and the meal was traditional beans and franks. Bill G Norton grilled the franks on the outdoor grill, and Anne had had her kidney beans simmering in molasses since nine that morning. They ate at the picnic table, and afterward they sat smoking, the four of them, 
talking desultory of Boston's fading pennant chances. There was a subtle change in the air. It was still pleasant enough, even in shirt, even in shirt sleeves. But there was a glint of ice in it now. Autumn was waiting in the wings, almost in sight. The large and ancient maple in front of Eva Miller's boarding house had already begun to go red. There had been no change in ben, Ben's relationship with the Nortons. Susan's liking for him was frank and clear and natural, and he liked her very much. And Bill, he sensed a steadily increasing liking, held in abeyance by the subconscious, held in abeyance by the subconscious taboo that affects all fathers when in the presence of men who are there, who are there because of their daughters rather than themselves. If you like another man and you are honest, you speak freely, discuss women over beer, shoot the shit about politics, but no matter how deep the potential liking, it is impossible to open up completely to a man who is dangling your daughter's potential defloration between his legs. Ben reflected that after marriage, the possible had become the actual, and could you become complete friends with the man who was banging your daughter night after night? There might be a moral there, but Ben doubted it. And Norton continued cool. Susan had told him a little of the Floyd Tibbetts situation the night before, of her mother's assumption that her son-in-law pro son in law problems had been resolved neatly and satisfactorily in that direction. Floyd was a known quantity. He was steady. Ben Mears, on the other hand, had come out of nowhere and might disappear back there just as quickly, possibly with her daughter's heart in his pocket. She distrusted the creative male with an instinctive small-town dislike, one that Edward Arlington Robinson or Sherwood Anderson would have recognized at once, and Ben suspected that down deep she had absorbed a maxim either maggots or ball studs, sometimes homicidal, suicidal, and maniacal, tend to send young girls packages containing their left ears. Ben's participation in the search for Ralphie Glick seemed to have increased her suspicions rather than allay them, and he suspected that winning her over was an impossibility. He wondered if she knew of Parkins, Gillespie, Parkins Gillespie's visit to his room. He was chewing these thoughts over lazily when, uh, Chloe, when Anne said, Terrible about the glip boy. Ralphie? Yes, Bill said. No, the older one, he's dead. Ben started. Who's, who, Danny? He died early yesterday morning. She seemed uh, surprised that the men did not know. It had been all the talk. I heard them talking in Milt, Susan said. Her hand found Ben's under the table, and he took it willful, willingly. How are the Glicks taking it? The same I would. The way I would, answered them simply. They are out of their minds. Well, they might be, Ben thought. Ten days ago, their life been going about its usual ordained cycle. Now their family unit was smashed and in pieces. It gave him a morbid chill. Do you think the other Glick boy will ever show up alive, Bill asked Ben. No, Ben said, I think he's dead too. Like that thing in Houston two years ago, Susan said. If he's dead, I almost hope they don't find him. Whoever could do something like that to a little defenseless boy. The police are looking around, I guess, Ben said, rounding up known sex offenders and talking to them. When they find the guy that ought, they ought to hang him up, up by the thumbs, Bill Norton said, badminton, Ben. Ben stood. No thanks. Too much like you playing solitaire with me for the dummy. Thanks for the nice meal. I've got work to do tonight. Ann Norton lifted her eyebrow and said nothing. Bill nodded. Bill stood. That's How's that new book coming? Good, Ben said briefly. Would you like to walk down the hill with me and have a soda at Spencer's, Susan? Oh, I don't know, Ann interposed swiftly. After Ralphie Glick and all, I'd feel better if... Mama, I'm a big girl, Susan interposed. And there are streetlights all the way up Rock Hill. I'll walk you back up, of course, Ben said, almost formally. He had left his car at Eva's. The early evening had been too fine to drive. They'll be fine, Bill said. You worry too much, Mother. Oh, I suppose I do. Young folks always know best, don't they? She smiled thinly. I'll just get a jacket, Susan murmured to Ben, and turned up the back walk. She was wearing a red play skirt, thigh high, and she exposed a lot of leg going up the steps to the door. Ben watched, knowing Anne was watching him watch. Her husband was damping the charcoal fire. How long do you intend to stay in the lot, Ben? Anne asked. <coughs> Excuse me. Showing polite interest. Until the book gets written, anyway, he said. 
After that, I can't say. It's very lovely in the mornings, and the air tastes good when you breathe it. He smiled into her eyes. I may stay longer. She smiled back. It gets cold in the winter, has been awfully cold. Then Susan was coming back down the steps with a light jacket thrown over her shoulders. Ready? I'm going to have a chocolate. Look out, complexion. Your complexion will survive, he said, and turned to Mr. and Mrs. Norton. Thank you again. Any time, Bill said. Come on over with a six-pack tomorrow night if you want. We'll make fun of that goddamn Yastrzemski. That would be fine. Fun, Ben said. But what'll we do after the second inning? His laughter, hearty and full, followed them around the corner of the house. And he ended uh, subcategory one onto subcategory two. I don't really want to go to Spencer's, she said as they went down to the hill. Let's go to the park instead. What about muggers, lady? He asked, doing the Bronx for her. In the law, all muggers have to be in by seven. It's a town ordinance. <laughs> and it is now exactly 8.03. Darkness had fallen over them. Excuse me. <clears throat> as they walked down to the hill and the shadows waxed and waned <coughs> in the street lights. Excuse me. Agreeable muggers you have, he said. No one goes to the park after dark. Sometimes the town gets kids go there to make out if they can't afford the drive in, she said, and winked at him. So if you see anyone skulking around in the bushes, look the other way. They entered from the they entered from the west side, which faced the municipal building. The park was shadowy and a little dream lake. The concrete wall walks curve curving away under the leafy trees, and the waiting pool glimmering quietly in the refracted glow from the street lights. If anyone was here, Ben didn't see him. They walked around the war memorial with its long, with its long list of names, the oldest from the Re Revolutionary War, the newest from Vietnam, carved under the War of 1812. There were six hometown names from the most recent conflict, the new cuts in the brass gleaming like fresh wounds, he thought. This town has the wrong name. It ought to be time, and as if the Action was a natural outgrowth of the thought. He looked over his shoulder for the Marston house, but the bulk of the municipal building blocked it out. She saw his glance, and it made her frown. As they spread their jackets on the grass and sat down, they had spurned the park benches without discussion, she said. Mom said Parkins Gillespie was checking up on you. The new boy in school must have stolen the milk money or something like that. He's quite a character, Ben said. Mom had you practically tried and convicted. It was said lightly, but the lightness faltered and let something serious through. Your mother doesn't care for me much, does she? No, Susan said, holding his hand. It was a case of dislike at first sight. I'm very sorry. It's okay, he said. I'm batting 500 anyway. Daddy, she smiled. He just knows class when he sees it. The smile faded. Ben, what's this new book about? That's hard to say. He slipped his loafers off and dug his toes into the dewy grass. Subject changer. Now, I don't mind telling you, and he found, surprisingly, that this was true. He had always thought of a work in progress as a child, a weak child that had to be protected and cradled. Too much handling would kill it. Kill it. He had refused to tell Miranda a word about Conway's daughter, Air Dance, although though she had been wildly curious about both of them. But Susan was different. With Miranda, there had always been a directed sort of probing, and her questions were more like interrogations. Just let me think how to put it together, he said. Can you kiss me while you think? She asked, lying back on the grass. He was forcibly aware of how short her skirt was. It had given a lot of brown. I think that might interfere with the thought processes, he said softly. Let's see. He leaned over and kissed her, placing one hand lightly on her waist. She met his mouth firmly, and her hands closed over his. A moment later, he felt her tongue for the first time, and he met it with his own. She shifted to return his kiss more fu fully, and the soft rustle of her cotton skirt seemed loud, almost maddening. He slid his hand up, and she arched her breast into it, soft and full. For the second time since he had known her, he felt sixteen, a head-busting sixteen, with everything in front of him, six lanes wide and no hard traveling in sight. Ben said, yes, make love to me. Do you want to? Yes, he said. I want that here on the grass, she said. Yes. She was looking up at him, her eyes wide in the dark. She said, make it be good. I'll try. Slow, he said. She said, slow, slow here. 
They became shadows in the dark. There he said, oh, Susan. Let's see how much we got there. Let me stop there tonight. Yeah, I'm going to stop here tonight. But in the next video, we'll be getting into um, part two, chapter five, subcategory three of Stephen King's Salem's Lot. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit that notification bell. Please stay safe and healthy. Good night.